properly served and the technicalities. Um, the court has no role in considering why the landlord might want possession and um, whether or not it's got anything to do with rent arrears, whether it's got anything to do with any problems that could be solved, um, and, when, and whatever the tenant's personal circumstances are, you could turn up to court saying, well, I or my partner has a very serious terminal illness, um, what have you, the, the judge would have to say, I'm very sorry, the most I can give you is a six-week suspension of the order, but no more than that, the landlord had all their paperwork in order, and, and they have a right to a, to a possession order. And that was the deregulation of the private rented sector, along with getting rid of um, rent control. Um, because there is no point, um, as far as the market is concerned, in um, doing things like getting rid of rent controls if you also don't get rid of security of tenure at the same time. If, if somebody has, if a tenant has the right to stay in the property and only be evicted if there is a good reason and the judge approves that there's a good reason, um, then that tenant will also argue for a lower rent, want rent controls and so forth. In order to get rid of rent controls, they also have to get rid of um, security of tenure. So in the private rented sector, it is a jungle out there. There are, as I say, no rights, or practically no rights. The only rights is to make sure that the, the two-month notice um, is, is in order. And what is happening more and more is that the, the sorts of landlords that Danny mentioned, um, maybe with less respect for the law, um, are fully prepared to evict tenants simply because they are asking the landlords to comply with their legal obligations. They are saying that the property is not in a proper state of repair, not, in, um, not a decent home, and, and so forth. The answer is um, an eviction notice. Um, it is also the case that more and more of those private landlords, certainly the small landlords, don't know very much about the law. Um, and certainly in my practice, I have noticed in the last two or three years an increase in the number of, of illegal evictions of landlords just coming round and evicting anyone, somebody without going through the process of applying to court. And that is wrong. That is against the law. It is not only a civil wrong, a tort, but it is actually a criminal offence. Um, the reality is that if a tenant in that position calls the police, the police don't usually know that that's a criminal offence and say things like, well, if you didn't pay your rent, mate, see why the landlord wanted you out, or try and negotiate it through. What they don't do is, is arrest the landlord. There are all sorts of remedies in law for people who have been illegally evicted, but those remedies depend on a number of things. They depend on being able to find a specialist housing lawyer who um, takes legal aid, who, who, who runs a legal aid practice, and believe me, legal aid has been massively cut over the last few years. Legal aid lawyers are an increasingly dying breed. We're hard to find. Um, they it, it, it also depends on um, being able to pin down, knowing who your landlord is, knowing that your landlord has enough resources for you to be able to enforce any court judgment that you get against the landlord. So it's very rare that somebody who has been illegally <coughs> evicted actually ever gets any sort of effective remedy for that. Um, in the social housing world, there's obviously much more, there is security of tenure. Um, in the old-fashioned sense of the world, there are still council tenant, tenants who, providing they pay their rent <coughs> and behave properly, have a tenancy for as long as they want, which is the right thing to do. It's their home. Um, people <coughs> have the right to um, put, down, put down roots in, in, in their home. But there is also, these days, a whole panoply of other sorts of tenancies in the social housing sector. Housing associations can um, have the right to evict somebody if they're in eight weeks of rent, for example, under what's called Grant A. Housing associations often behave like private landlords and just give you the limited private rented um, security of tenure under an assured short hold. And there are a whole load of tenancies, even in the um, council, area of council tenancies, where um, the council has the right to evict tenant without the court scrutinising um, the, the, the reason for that. And all those types of tenancies, tenancies that don't come with security of tenure, are increasing. Um, the coalition government brought in, 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 in what is um, typical Orwellian language, what they call flexible tenancies. So council since April 
2012 have had the right to um, grant fixed term tenancies, so they're not flexible at all, they are for a fixed period of time, minimum period two years, can be five years, with the idea being that when that period of time comes to an end, the council will decide whether or not you should still be a council tenant, whether or not you still need a council tenancy, and we haven't yet seen, obviously, those cases coming through the court. But again, there will be, as and when they do, there will be no right for the tenant to say, well, I've always paid my rent, well, why can't I just stay here? If the council has, provide, has complied with the right technical periods of notice and so forth, then um, tenants will be evicted. Um, and that actually is an uh, example, I think, of what is happening to social housing. So social housing used to be, Nye Bevan, who was combined being Minister for Health, in the 1945 Labour government with being Minister for Housing. The two jobs went hand in hand. And he had a vision of building high quality council housing across the country so that everybody would want to live in it, rich people too. Um, and he was very proud of that vision. Um, now that vision, to a certain extent, continued during the 50s and 60s in that all governments built council housing and encouraged the building of council housing. To a certain extent it didn't, because from the Tory government in the 50s, then less and less money was put into council housing. So it got built, but not to um, the sort of quality that Nye Bevan had in mind. Um, but since the sell-off of council housing, starting over 30 years ago under Thatcher, and everything else that has happened to council housing, then council housing is firstly became rationed very strictly according to need, famously, the joke was, you know, you got pregnant in order to go to council house and anyone who wasn't pregnant wouldn't go to council house. So those, I mean, that was always nonsense, but that was based on the idea that because council housing was in short supply, then it would be rationed according to different levels of need. Um, nowadays, and it started under New Labour, and it's, it's, it's been massively increased in the coalition government, then... Council housing is in hugely short supply, so obviously the principal form of allocation is supposed to be need, um, and the 1.8 million families who are waiting on council um, waiting lists, nearly all of them have huge levels of housing need. They will desperately need a secure home, and they can't afford to buy anywhere um, for the reasons that Danny has been talking about. But on top of that, you've got a whole level of other criteria that council can now use and are actively using. So a number of councils have now brought in residence qualifications. Buckingham and Dagenham is looking at a 10-year residence qualification. In other words, you're not entitled to council housing unless you've, unless you've lived in Barking and Dagenham for 10 years. Um, <coughs> a number of other councils um, have committed themselves not to, have, not to provide council houses, houses for people who come in through the homeless route. Um, even though there's a legal argument that they're required to do so, and that's currently being looked at by the court, by the courts. And then there are all sorts of other criteria. Councils can exclude people from their waiting lists if they've got histories of rent arrears, if there are allegations of histories of antisocial behaviour. So it's become, on top of need, a whole series of um, judgmental decisions are being made about people who apply for council housing. Um, and that, I think, is, is a very frightening development. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about the bedroom tax, um, because, as I say, the bedroom tax is supposed to be sort of this sort of paradigm. Surely judges won't enforce it. And there are two things happening in the legal world about the bedroom tax. Um, the first is the issue of what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day level, as and when people who are in arrears as a result of the bedroom tax find themselves um, up in front of the court with their landlord, housing association or council landlord asking for possession. Um, and the answer to that is we don't yet know what, is tax, what will happen to those people. The bedroom tax has been enforced for a year. It takes a while for somebody to get into sufficient arrears that their landlord will start possession proceedings and possession proceedings themselves can take a while. So we haven't yet seen um, many of those cases come through the court and it will be quite rare because people who get into rent arrears do so because they're poor, and that means that they, um, they don't necessarily have all their arrears attributed to one reason. 
So it's quite rare to be able to identify the pure bedroom tax case as opposed to somebody who, because of poverty, has chaotic, has chaotic finances. Um, but the question is whether judges will be evicting people in those circumstances. We don't know. There is a test for council tenants who are in arrears, and most housing association tenants, um, not only are you in arrears, but is it reasonable to make an order for possession? And you might think, well, that's where the bedroom checks argument comes in, that it's not reasonable to make an order for possession if somebody is only threatened with eviction because of the bedroom tax. The other side of the coin is that most rent arrears cases where there is where, where somebody can get legal help, you spend the um, you, you you use that legal help in order to buy time so that you can go back to court and say, actually I can now I've sorted out my finances, I've made sure I've claimed all the benefits I'm entitled to and so forth. And um, I can now say I can pay my rent and I can contribute to the arrears. By definition, anyone who is a pure bedroom tax case is not going to be in a position to say to the court, I can pay my rent. They're going to be saying to the court, my rent is going to carry on increasing by 14% or 25% a week, depending on the number of bedrooms. So it's going to be a very difficult balancing act for judges, and I am not hopeful that people are going to be saved by judges. The other big bedroom tax um, point in the legal world was the judicial review test case <coughs> challenge in the case of MA and Secretary of State for Work and Pension. And that was a properly targeted test case. It was not a challenge to the whole principle of the bedroom tax, because every lawyer know that um, judges would just say, well, it was a political decision made by elected parliamentarians, and we as unelected judges are not going to intervene. But it was quite deliberately targeted at disabled adults who, for different reasons, would need what the Tories call a spare room. And, and and even I, and I'm, as you know, pessimistic about judges, even I expected that to succeed. Extraordinarily, at the two court levels where it's been heard, the Administrative Court and now the Court of Appeal, it has failed. The challenge has failed. In the judges at both levels accepted that the uh, bedroom tax was potentially discriminatory against disabled people. They looked at it and they said, yes, clearly, there is, if a disabled person needs an extra room and then is penalised through the bedroom tax, then that is potentially discriminatory. So the burden then shifts to the government to explain it. Um, and in both cases, the judges said, well, actually, the Secretary of State has explained this perfectly well, and so we've decided that it is not discriminatory. And the Secretary of State's reasoning was twofold. One is that everybody has disabled adults are not a homogenous group. Each case needs to be considered separately, and therefore discretionary housing payments, which are obviously discretionary, it's up to the local council to decide whether or not you get them, and they're time limited. Discretionary housing payments will actually resolve that problem. And the Secretary of State also said, and this was a very political decision, we considered it very carefully, Parliament debated it and so forth. So the judges backed off and said, okay, it may look discriminatory, but it's not actually discriminatory when you listen to the Secretary of State's reasoning. And that does confirm my point that you absolutely do not rely on judges to try and protect the rights of vulnerable people. That case we hope is going to the Supreme Court. Who knows whether those um, judges at the top will um, take a different view. Just very, very quickly, um, all of this, of course, needs to be seen in a number of contexts. One is the context of a massive assault on welfare benefits, the failure to increase welfare benefits in line with inflation, the benefit cap, um, and the effect of the benefit cap of, of poor families having to move out of expensive areas, which is broadly London and the South East. The abolition of council tax benefit and its replacement by what's called the council tax reduction scheme, but which only funds 80% of the previous level of council tax benefit. But the idea being that councils will now require somebody who is getting 100% council tax benefit and therefore not paying any council tax to pay um, a certain amount towards their council tax each week, even if they get 80% discount um, there will still be something to pay from your welfare benefits, which have been calculated on the basis that you don't have to pay council tax. 
Um, and I think, actually, everyone talks about bedroom tax being the new poll tax. I think it's that that's the new poll tax. And you'll have seen on the television some London boroughs doing mass summonses in the magistrates' court for non-payment of council tax. That's just where we were 20 years ago with the, with the poll tax. <coughs> the, um, and, and I've already mentioned um, cuts to legal aid. It is harder and harder for legal aid lawyers to continue to provide legal aid services solely legal aid services. There are huge areas in the country which are called housing and vice deserts where it is impossible to find a specialist housing lawyer who deals um, with legal aid. And by definition, most of the people that I've talked about need legal aid because if you can afford to pay a lawyer, then you're usually not in trouble with rent arrears. <laughs> you, know, you can afford to spend that money on, on paying off your rent arrears or paying off your mortgage arrears or whatever it is. And I'm the thing I am finding very shocking at the moment, um, and again, I think it comes from all three major political parties, is the demonization of the poor that we have seen in the media, and, and of course, the demonization of migrants, which has been going on for a number of years, but has stepped up a lot in the last year or so. Um, and obviously, UKIP is, UKIP is responsible for that, but the major political parties are responsible.